Ernie and Nomi. And then we've uh, a special guest uh, with us for this panel, David Reddell. So David Reddell is a former Assistant Secretary of Commerce for in Information and Communications and former NTIA Administrator. Uh, again, you can find a full bio of David on the conference webpage. So welcome to all the panelists and thank you very much for participating in our conference. Um, so I've got a set of questions that kind of hopefully we can, we can tie all these things together. So I'll lob the first question out to Scott and then uh, let every one of the other panelists weigh in on it. Um, so pretty easy to start off with. So Scott, well, maybe not. Scott, what would you consider the key takeaways from your panel? What should we walk away remembering from this? So, so I have a quote from uh, Peter that is, uh, spectrum is not rocket science. So I guess, I guess <laughs> that would be my, my first takeaway. Um, but to, to follow up from that, uh, we had a, you know, a lot of discussion about, you know, sharing in terms of, uh, you know, trust, coordination, and collaboration are are critical uh, to achieve the the end goals. And I think uh, David also pointed out an interesting uh, thread that space service bands are already inherently shared uh, with other services and then even within the bands uh, within the space services across a range of operators who do their own self-coordination so that some of you know, some of those elements that are maybe uh, less typical in the terrestrial environment have have been part of the, the heritage of the of the space services. Okay, thank you. Um, Nomi, how about from your panel? <clears throat> You're on mute. Um, you know, I think first we talked about what is spectrum sharing, and I think I think there was general con consensus that it's an operation of independent systems that's um, close enough together that um, dynamic mechanisms would be required for harmful interference. We then next talked a little bit about how real is scarcity? And I guess I heard from our panelists that maybe there isn't such real scarcity, um, but yet they the, the high value placed on spectrum and that often operators sometimes ask for spectrum, not just because they need it, but they also, you know, they want to be careful that they still have it. So any, anyhow, but there was great optimism for spectrum sharing. We went through some of the historic efforts um, everybody thought that we're learning a lot from CBRS, although um, it has been very complex. And I think that there was there was a lot of um, caution on our panel about um, while about while we should definitely be looking at all kinds of technologies to embrace um, sharing. That let's try not to make it too complicated. There was also a lot of interest in some of the technologies to support. Um, sh spectrum sharing, such as having better identifiers so that there could be better enforcement, um, things like that. And good, good discussions about trust, which I kept thinking about overnight as well. So anyhow, that's much more of it. Those are a few headlines. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Ari, next. Yeah, there was a little bit of overlap uh, uh, between um, the my panel and Nomi's panel. A little overlap um, um, between all of the panels. I mean, uh, my big takeaway, my key takeaways were um, the gold standard still seems to be uh, exclusive use spectrum where possible, but um, there was a realization by the panelists on my panel that um, there's not a whole lot of spectrum left that um, uh, can be allocated in that way. And so sharing is going to happen. It's a reality. Um, you know, there was a lot of discussion about making sure that uh, the rules are set as clearly as possible. Um, ex post enforcement when when the rules are violated was um, viewed as very, very important. Um, the trust point that Nomi mentioned was also stressed a lot. Um, so um, on my panel, it was important for um, all stakeholders to trust each other and to understand each other's motivations, including the motivations of federal government um, users that are focused on mission and may not be able to sort of, you know, quantify the, 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 the benefits of, of their, uh, their use, use of the spectrum in the same way that the commercial providers can. 
All right, thank you. And so David, since you weren't a moderator of a panel, can you take a step back and give us the, the high level view of this? Sure. So I, I look, looking at the themes across all these panels, I think there's there's three things that that's, that struck me as I looked at them. One was, it, you know, and this happens seemingly with every new issue in tech and telecom. Um, we're talking about spectrum sharing. And I think if you asked every one of the moderators um, to define spectrum sharing, you'd probably get a different definition. I think when we had a look at these panels, the panelists were all working for different operating definitions. And, and that is a function of you are where you sit, right? Um, and that struck me as part of this, that we don't have a common vocabulary for what we mean uh, when we talk about this. I mean, to take the most striking example, the commercial sector, wireless looks at sharing, it says sharing means DOD, shrink your footprint as small as you can and we'll get everything else. And you ask DOD and DO, to DOD sharing means we change absolutely nothing and you just find a way to work around everything we're already doing. And neither of those are what is an optimal outcome. And I think that leads to the second point that all of the, the, the moderators have brought up so far and that's trust. And I think what you can see here and maybe what we danced around a little bit but I think we got to is the trust deficit in these conversations. There is a trust deficit between the FCC and the NTIA at the moment. So you've got two spectrum regulators that can't trust each other for the time being. There is a trust deficit between government users who constantly hide behind the fact that they have national security as an excuse, whether it's true or not. And the wireless industry who constantly hides behind we pay for spectrum as the reason why they should have it. Neither are good answers unless you can justify why you, you need to be in that position. And I think until we get past that trust deficit, you're not gonna be able to solve this spectrum sharing problem that we see. And, and there's a, it's a problem because there's real opportunities that I think are being held back. And, and we heard a little bit of that throughout the different panels. The last thing I'd put out there is, you know, and this is one that I know Silicon Flatirons has done a lot of work on, I've talked about before at Silicon Flatirons is, is if we're gonna look at spectrum sharing, we have to address the disparate economic interests when it comes to spectrum sharing. You know, at the very end of the last panel, Len Cali brought up, you know, the, the economics of a commercial wireless system. You get to free ride on their investment. You get the scale benefits of being part of a handset economy that's a commercial off the shelf handset economy. And that's great, but that economic value is of limited utility to some government users. And frankly, what they're trying to do may not be explainable in what we ordinarily think of as sort of Wall Street economic terms. And I think sort of a 30,000 foot overview, that, that's really the things I saw. Common definitions need to be addressed, trust deficit needs to be addressed, and the economic incentives of each of the parties need to be addressed. Oh, great, thank you. Um, so Naomi, I'll, I'll toss the next one out to you, which is, you know, you, you were the lead of the technology panel. So are there areas of, of, do you leave this with hope or concern? Are you an optimist or a pessimist? Where? Do... Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I definitely am an optimist. And I think, you know, I go back to, um, and then I want to come back to the trust point though, but I go back to Marty Cooper's comments that, um, that, that always our technology, emer you know, emerging new technologies have more than, um, have more than kept up with our needs. And, and we heard so many of them, you know, through, throughout our panel. So I'm, I'm definitely an optimist, you know, you know, to, and just tying that into the points we've just heard from my fellow panelists here that I do think that the technology, technology investments that we can make to increase trust at this stage, they may be more important than the technologies to increase efficiency. You know, which I think in the past I might not have said, but I think it's becoming that important because I think if, if we can if we can make progress in the technologies that increase trust, I think then we'll have more runway to um, to develop better technologies to increase efficiency. So so that would include things like um, technologies to improve identification, um, enforcement, um, and probably alongside um, some of the privacy and security. So I, I think those are. If, if I were if I were to give advice, um, you know, coming out of our panel, I think that's going to be really important. Great, thank you. Any of the other panelists want to add on that? Um, I, I I agree. I'm optimistic as well um, because I do think the technology is improving, um, uh, and I do agree with Nomi that. Um, focusing a little bit more on technology that um, actually helps build trust among stakeholders 
as opposed, I mean, it, both are important. Um, increasing efficiency is very important as well, but the trust is really important. And I think something that came up on my panel was there was a lot of discussion even today. I don't know how long it's been since the five gigahertz DFS issue surfaced, it, you know, but people are still talking about it because, you know, the, the, it took a long time to resolve the issue when um, people were um, essentially, you know, dis-enabling the DFS functions or capabilities on uh, devices that, you know, were, were supposed to be, supposed to have those capabilities. When they did that, interference was caused. Um, the victims were very concerned about it. It took a long time for them to resolve that interference issue. We got to figure out a way to address enforcement. We've got to be able to, as Lynn, I think, mentioned on my panel, we got to figure out a better way to remediate um, these issues. And if we are able to do that, remediate more quickly, that will go a long way to, um, you know, um, building the trust that we all um, know that we need to have if, if spectrum sharing is going to be, um, become more extensive. Just, you know, I'll make a general comment. We we can choose to be optimist or we can choose to be pessimist. I mean that's a you know that's an active choice and you know choosing optimism leans into building trust, right? Choosing optimism leans into trying to find partners and trying to you know work through the problems. When we when we lean toward pessimism, we become insular, right? We 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 kind of build those walls, and so I think if we're gonna make progress in the area uh, that you know, I came across on all the panels as being trust and collaboration, I think we have to decide to be optimistic um, and that will you know, move us in, in those directions. Now, everybody has battle scars and you know, I think you gotta, you gotta figure out how to put some of those, some of those aside. Those that have been around longer have more, right? Those, those are you know, the, the students here who are just getting into, to spectrum, they don't they don't carry that baggage, right? They and they tend to be inherently optimistic, and I think that's important. Thank you, David. You looked like you were you were getting ready to say something there. Did you want to add to that? No, I I, I chuckle as the um, clearly the New York cynic on on the group. Um, uh, you know that choosing to be optimistic is its choice, and and I agree with Scott. It is. Um, I think there is a bit of a first mover disadvantage that has played out time and again for being optimistic. And so I, it's a two way street, both, both sides of these transactions or all the sides when it comes to real true dynamic sharing are gonna have to go in with a rosy outlook and, and fresh expectations. You know, the expectation of I just get to do what I want and nothing gets impacted, which seems to be where everybody starts in these conversations is gonna have to get set aside. Um, that playbook, unfortunately, has been run to exhaustion. And if we, we stick to that, uh, you know, as Scott points, points out, if we don't choose to go down a different path, yeah, we're going we're gonna to run up against that brick wall and over, over and over and over again. And, uh, and I'm hopeful that people go that direction. Yeah, I mean, David makes a really good point. I mean, basically, we should be optimistic, but we also should not be under any illusions that we're going to get everything that we want based on prior everybody has scars here <laughs> everyone has the scars to prove it especially david you know um <laughs> there it, it it's 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 good to be optimistic but we can't go in with rose colored glasses we really have to know what we're getting into and uh, recognize that uh it, you know uh, these issues are very very difficult um a lot of uh, strong feeling on all sides and um you know no, Ari, you're absolutely right. I mean, look, I worked for health industry. I worked for Congress. I worked for the administration in my career. And, and so I've sort of, at this point, I think everyone in spectrum policy has something they hate me for along the way, um, which is a unique person to be in uh, in any rate. Um, but yeah, I think part of the challenge to this, and I, I think these kinds of conversations help, is that everybody has to drop the pretense and have a real conversation about what is in the art of the doable, both technologically and economically. Uh, you know, you can't expect the wireless industry to show up with billions and billions and billions of dollars to pay for spectrum that's unusable for them. And you can't expect the U.S. government to make 
things that are physically impossible possible because we want to raise money by auctioning off Spectrum. And I think the sooner we recognize that each side has a legitimate starting point from which we can all work, the better off we'll be. That's not where we are right now on Spectrum policy. And, and frankly, the way things are going with everybody being locked down during a pandemic and not able to have face-to-face -face conversations, I think that's affirmatively har harming us. I, it's not that I don't love doing these Zooms. Uh, I, you know, I think we've all learned to embrace Zoom culture, but you know, <clears throat> and across from many of you at a negotiating table before or across a conference room table, and it is different. It's affirmatively different to sit across from someone and have a real honest person-to-person -person conversation than doing it sitting at your desk, you know, with a thousand distractions around you. And, and I think as, as crazy as that sounds, I don't know that we'll be able to have those frank conversations until people are sure they're not sitting there watching the recording like blink on Zoom while they're talking to somebody else. Great comment. If I could just also add, I really like what 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 each of my fellow panelists are saying. I just want to go back to Scott point. I thought, I thought you said that really beautifully, Scott. And um, I wanted to tie in, um, there, was a, there was a comment in the Q&A during my panel um, where John Chapin drew, drew a, an analogy to what's being done today with roaming um, between mobile network operators, that one could say that that, what, that is um, an existing example of of sharing with of local resources and and certainly you can see that in roaming um, trust has, is inherently there um, because there's a, a trusted commercial agreement and trusted usage of and trusted implementation of the agreement and so I just think it um it, it it's really nice proof that um that that sharing can work well when there's when there's trust in 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 quite innovative ways. So, so let me kind of build on that. And, and you, know, you mentioned technology that could help us build trust. And then I, I wanna go back to one of the comments that Andy Clegg made in, in Ari's panel about the, uh, I, I'll call it interference limits that came up uh, from the time of Marconi, I think he said. <laughs> okay, and I've, I've got some experience with that where um, you know, a, a, an entity will claim interference limits that just, whoa, that, that there's, What's the justification for that? And that would seem to me to be one of the, the areas where we need to build trust, that, that we wanna be able to know that the other party is, 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 is speaking fairly and are dealing with the right kind of numbers. How do we establish an environment? Do we, are there technological tools we should be developing? How do we establish this environment to ensure that we're not uh, just arguing numbers with whoever yells the loudest? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take a crack, but, you know, I'm not an engineer, but I, I will tell you that, um, you know, I, it was very interesting what Andy said. Um, he was basically, you know, complaining that a lot of times this, the protection criteria that's developed, that the incumbent systems, you know, always cite um, uh, when they oppose or express concern about a new entrant coming in is always, you know, was based on worst case analysis, right? And he was suggesting that we, that regulators move to a probabilistic analysis, a more, uh, the, you know, taking into consideration more what is likely to happen. Um, I am a little, you know, maybe I'm an incrementalist. I, I've seen the FCC try to do that. Um, in various proceedings, but I am also a little skeptical that the regulators are never going to go where Andy wants them to go there because, you know, often in these FCC proceedings last a long time, um, the uh, incumbents, you know, they're formidable, uh, you know, they, 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 they become very political and they're, they're are, they are stakeholders um, often with uh, significant um, uh, political power. Um, and the FCC, I think just instinctively doesn't wanna do anything that, that uh, increases the potential for interference to any incumbent um, service. That said, the FCC has in recent years 
focused more on the probabilistic analysis and they've they've sort of uh, distinguished you know they they pushed away some of those old ITU um, recommended protection criteria they've they've sort of distinguished them um, I think that whatever happens is going to be incremental whatever um, whatever progress is made to get the regulators to sort of uh, focus more on um, likely case, case as opposed to worst case in their um, in setting these uh, protection criteria is to be incremental. You know, we're not going to, you know, they're not going to be, it's not going to be a, a, a significant uh, change um, over a short period of time. But again, that, that's the lawyer's perspective. I'll jump in. I, there was a, a question in the in the Q and A also that Pierre put uh, in for us that that points out that there was a comment about receiver standards as a, a bit of a thread uh, throughout the comments, and and I think I can tie that into what what Ari was saying, which is uh, you know politically and, and occurs both on Capitol Hill and at the agencies. Uh, it does seem like sometimes there is a tendency to believe that some services have an absolute right to exist without changing, and and that can't be the case. Um, we, we can't allow any service to just go out there and assume that the RF environment around them will never change and that they have an absolute right to exist. Um, receiver standards is a bit of, uh, you know, a, a bit of a third rail for a lot of people who talk about this. And I'm not the first one to bring this up, but I, I feel like this is a good point to pivot to and say, but that doesn't mean you don't set ideas about receiver performance as part of the conversation. And you set expectations. And by the way, this goes towards our trust deficit point, which is that you need to set expectations that this is what the RF environment will look like. You need to build your device to assume you will be receiving this level of emissions from out of band. If you choose not to, we're not going to force you to build your receivers the way you want. But buyer beware, caveat emptor. If you build a cheap device and you get interference, it's a whole big mess and not the FCC's problem. They're going to tell you to go fix it yourself. And, and I think that's the issue we have to get to, is that right now it's a first in time, first in right situation. Once you put yourself out in the band, you've occupied that band, and God forbid there are any emissions in, whether they're your fault or not, um, you, you feel like you're owed a remedy. I think you have to set some kind of expectations. And once we set those expectations and both sides understand what they're getting into, you can establish that level of trust. I trust you will build a device that isn't so cheap that me operating within my parameters in my adjacent band is going to interfere with you and cause me to go to the FCC and answer questions. I, I think that would go a long way towards both what uh, Ari is talking about and towards the trust deficit that we've all been talking about. So I wanted to follow up on what David was saying, and maybe this also connects back to sort of some of the, you know, the economics um, as well. And I think, you know, when we think about spectrum and some of these use cases, the, the scientific use case is an interesting and, you know, from my perspective, somewhat somewhat different beast, right? Trying to operate significantly below the noise floor or operating, you know, investments in very expensive uh, equipment, you know, that are trying to push the, the state of the art. And it's hard to articulate a economic case, uh, you know, a lot of times with the scientific use case. And so I, I guess I'm I'm posing a question to to the you know, with regards to sharing. We talk a lot about you know, the federal users and the commercial users, but um, in some sense, scientific um, those are also the federal users. Um, you know, what's what's the thoughts there with regards to, to sharing and and standards um, and and you know managing systems that are operating you know near the thermal limit. Interesting. Keith, I'll jump in. I think I'll just jump in to share some technologies that I think are going to be important to cultivating this trust. Um, and actually, I've learned I learned a lot of some some of this maybe I had learned before, but some of this I more acutely learned in preparation for the panel. Um, I learned about work that um, NTIA had asked Sismic to do to see if they could use NTIAs and and the FCC's authorization, equipment authorization rules, if they could be modified to require that all transmitters use unique identifiers. And I think that identifier is going to be, and I know I just mentioned it a little bit earlier, but just to say a little bit more about it, I think it's gonna be really important because um, uh, 
there's sort of an assumption out there that everybody will play nice with how they with usage of spectrum, but um, but but people and companies cheat, and this you know requires enforcement and requires incentives, and so that people so we have a way to prosecute bad actors. And I think I think these identifiers are going to be important, and we have a history of doing this on radio, um, and. Um, you know, I guess you have ham radio also where there's um, unique identifiers, you use small amounts of bandwidth. And I think that this kind of, this concept, um, Dale was telling us a little bit about some work he's written on RF fingerprinting, I think it's going to be um, really important um, to, as, as an important way to create trust. And another thing I learned in, in preparing for the panel was I, I and I want to give credit to again, to John Chapin for work he's doing in, I don't want to steal his thunder, but a concept he's putting together called spectrum science, which involves everything from the monitoring techniques, again, where you would need the identification to, um, to management techniques, ways that you could perhaps dynamically control interference behavior, um, and then ways that you could also have in, enable information sharing, um, as well, so I, I do. I do think all of this is going to be very important to, to, to finding new ways um, to, 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 to new, new, um, new ways to to share. Hopefully, in a more complex, dynamic way than the more static methods of sharing that we have today. So, if if I can chime in on that, Naomi, I, I don't disagree with you in terms of sort of fixed transmitters. I think, in somewhere, Amy Stepanovich is smiling that I'm bringing this up. Um, I think with respect to individual commercial mobile transmitters, I think you'd have a, a, a serious privacy concern with individual IDs. I mean, as it is, INSI skimmers are enough of a privacy nightmare, and those are heavily controlled and regulated. So putting, I don't disagree with you. I just throw that out no. as, a, as a cautionary tale. You're so right. You're so right. Thank you, David. I did neglect to say that. Please, please go on. Yeah. And, but to, to Scott's point, uh, you know, I, I hear you. And I think if we're going to be looking at how to ensure any of these uses for which you have an, uh, as I said earlier, a non Wall Street typical economic case. And certainly scientific research falls into the bucket of non Wall Street typical when we're looking at spectrum use. I, I think the leadership of how we're going to look at that is going to have to come from government, whether it's the executive branch or the legislative branch, there's going to have to be someone who affirmatively says it is more important to society that we do X with respect to this band and this scientific research in this location or these locations, than it is to put more spectrum in the commercial marketplace. And I don't know what those would look like, where those options would be, but I think it's something that if we're gonna do it, it's gonna have to be led by the government. It's not something the market's gonna work out on its own because it's not a typical economic use case. So I just throw out there that if, if it's gonna happen, I feel like it's gotta come out of the .gov set. You're smiling at that. Any comments to back follow that up? I agree with what David said about um, passive services and you know the scientific community and, and their use of um, the radio spectrum. Certainly, um, policymakers have to decide what is a public good, um, um, what is what they deem to be socially valuable, um, regardless of what the economic what you know what the economic value might be or what the perceived economic value might be but that's what policymakers do that's why you know we paid them the big bucks right <laughs> keith were, were we making big bucks when we were together? i don't remember i was just that. thinking about that <laughs> that, was, that was a joke <laughs> uh, anybody else want to pick that up or so I, I, I'm taking notes as we've been talking, and we we you know we mentioned early on. Nomi mentioned uh, technology for trust, and I can think of a number of technologies that were kind of brought up over the course of the of the conversation. One was Andy Clegg uh, advocating for better propagation models. Um, you know, uh, Nomi brought up uh, uh, transmitter IDs. We could talk about automated enforcement mechanisms. Um, so kind of what other technologies are needed and how would, how, if, if you were the uh, investor or, or the government deciding where to invest the money to push spectrum sharing forward, 
How would you prioritize these? Where would we start? Is, is uh, uh, propagation sure models the most important thing or? I'm not sure it starts with the government. And, and I'm, I'm gonna sound like I'm beating a dead horse here, but I'm gonna come back to the trust question. I, I think it's gotta start by some sort of consensus about a way to move forward that respects all the players in the game. And that can't be handed out from the United States government. It's gonna have to be, you know, to, to use an overused term at this point, a public-private partnership. I mean, not, not, in, not in the traditional sense, it's gonna have to be a meeting of the minds between commercial users, unlicensed users, government users, scientific passive service users, all of these people are going to have to agree, yes, this has promise for us and we're not being cut out. I think to date, that's part of the challenge that we've seen with all of the paths we've taken forward is that somebody feels like they're in the short end of the stick and that they were told this is the solution and get on board. Um, I, I just think in, until we have everybody at the table, and, and frankly, the closest we've come to having everybody at the table to play the game is, is when we had the PCAST during the Obama administration. I think that was the closest we came to having enough people at the table to have a general consensus on trying to drive some technology forward in spectrum sharing. Now, look, we could spend another complete hour arguing about the failings of the PCAST model. And I know Ari <laughs> and I have spent several hours arguing the failings of the PCAST model in the past. I think that's the closest we've come. And it, it does show that you, you can get people at the table to make compromises. Um, you need a bigger group than that, or at least a more representative group. But I think that's how you're going to have to do it going forward. So to the extent that the government has a role at all, I would say it's their convening authority. It's getting people at the table to have candid conversations. OK. Ari, you've spent hours arguing with him. Do you want to argue well, no, now? No, no, I, I agree with what <laughs> Dave's saying. I mean, I, I'm trying to figure out a way to disagree, but I, I'm agreeing with everything he's saying. I, I will say that um, just, you know, the debate about what propagation model to use. I mean, I, again, I, I don't want to bore people. I, I've spent too much time at the FCC um, in these proceedings um, on both sides, sometimes representing potential new entrants, so, you know, sometimes representing incumbents. And, you know, getting everyone to agree on what the right propagation model should be will end up being very difficult. Um, I'm I'm almost sort of will I'm almost sort of convinced to take the approach that um, Coleman was suggesting, um, which was to whatever, no matter how messy the process was or unfair the process was, uh, in setting whatever the protection criteria the you know the applicable protection criteria is, set that criteria and then have the parties be um, have the ability give the parties the ability to contract around that criteria. It doesn't help often new entrants if, if, if the government, if the FCC sets the standards standards for protecting incumbents that are just too difficult, it's going to make it very difficult for new entrants to actually um, put together a viable business. I mean, and we've seen that a lot. We've, we've seen how new entrants have spent years and years at the FCC to uh, getting approval for some new service to be introduced into a, a, a frequency band, but only um, fail at the end of that process, failing from a business perspective because the rules were too stringent, viewed as too stringent. Um, but you know, uh, once there are rules, parties can contract around them, and we've seen that work. Too that 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 framework actually work as well. So you know, I, I just throw it out there. I I guess I'm again. I apologize for being an incrementalist here. I do think that we're never going to have agreement on what the right propagation model is or what the correct you know whether the FCC should be focused on probabilistic analysis or worst case analysis and determining potential for interference. Um, that it's going to take a. That's going to be very difficult. It's going to be very difficult to get everyone to agree on those types of concepts. But you know, um, I think in, in in some ways that it's more important to just sort of set the standard and then have the uh, you know um, parties have you know, give parties the ability to contract around them, whatever they are. <laughs>
Nomi, Scott, any any thoughts on that? I I think it was well said by by Ari. No no additional comments. <laughs> I, I I agree as well. I do think that this that these efforts and and I like what David said too about um, probably the importance of public private partnerships and also of engineering standard engineering organizations and standards organizations in establishing um, in establishing the the role of these of these new elements. I, I see in the questions we've gotten quite there was a comment from John Rowe about giving standard organizations a greater role. Um, I think I think that's very interesting and. Um, and Patri um, is also asking about identifiers and fingerprinting. And um, I, I think I think his comment is is I know he's asking a question about how to get this over regulatory boundaries internationally, but I do think that's all the more reason why this this needs to be debated in engineering organizations um, to, to determine how we how we we will have to do it internationally. I com I completely agree with the premise there. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I, we've got about uh, just under 10 minutes left. Um, I guess I'd like to ask for, for closing thoughts on this. I mean, where, where do we go? And so uh, start back at the beginning with Scott. You know, I, I guess, again, I'll, I'll circle back to, to being an optimist. Um, I, and I think it's continuing conversations uh, such as such as these getting one of the one of the comments we we had discussed in the um in, in our panel was uh, a couple of things i mean one was we have to make spectrum understandable to the non-expert uh to to have broader engagement and then you know we also have to it's important to engage a a multidisciplinary wide group of stakeholders to to be looking looking at problems to 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 be bringing the the perspectives um, that are unique for each one of the stakeholders to the to the issues. So, um, I think it's I think it's hard work. Uh, it takes you know conversations and and efforts to to um, gather, discuss, collaborate, and you know events like the this conference, you know, help to help to move that forward. Thank you, Nomi. I, I also agree with Scott. I remain an optimist. I think there are so many really exciting technologies that offer so much promise for inner service sharing. Um, and I think we need, we need, I think we learned in our panels, you know, and in about the many, the many wonderful um, historic efforts that are happening, um, you know, such as, um, Jonathan shared, in for, you know, updates about the experiments there, the ITS experiments that they're running. Um, I think the CBRS um, effort has given us an incredible opportunity to have a really large world, real world experiment in spectrum sharing from which we're learning so much. So we can see this is worth it. Um, and I think we just need to continue having these, these discussions and, and um, yeah, I, yeah. I, th I think this is very good and a great conference. Thank you for putting it together, Keith. Thank you. I, I agree, Keith. Um, this has been a great conference. Uh, I've really learned a lot. One thing I'd like to see, and I think we probably will see so something like this during the Biden administration, is um, kind of a, this um, exploration of sharing by design um, or identification of a spectrum band uh, where uh, sharing is more uh, viewed as being more feasible than, than, than other bands, designation of a couple of bands for sharing. Um, and um, I think it would be a great green, one of these sort of a great experiment, greenfield um, uh, experiment, a place where there are incumbent operations, but where, um, uh, where um, we think that it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to um, try to reallocate the spectrum um, because of the incumbent users uses and because of you know the, the difficulty of, of moving incumbents out, off that spectrum. I think uh, if we can identify a couple of bands, and I know that people like John Leibowitz has already um, suggested a couple of bands, um, uh, if we can 
identify spectrum bands like that, I think um, um, it would be well worth the effort to try to sort of, you know, um, promote spec spectrum sharing in, in, in those bands. And I didn't get a chance to ask my panel uh, the question that I wanted to ask them about that. Um, but it, it's definitely something that um, I'd like to see. Well, Ari, from your lips to the Energy and Commerce Committee's ears, because not 14 hours ago, they put out text that would make 3.1 to 345 available for opportunistic know. use until such time they decide to put licenses in there. Well, that that's great. And they did it because I was thinking about it, right, David? <laughs> it's the telepathy <laughs> link you have with the staff. Yes, I'm sure. Okay, David, I'm looking to you to back clean up there. Yeah, no, I, I thank you, by the way, for having me on this panel. I realized I was not a moderator on any of the earlier panels. So in some ways I am, you know, Waldorf and Statler from the Muppet Show, you know, coming in <laughs> from the balcony with, with snarky remarks. But um, I, look, I think this was a really good panel and a really good wrap up to what was a, a very productive Spectrum conference. Um, so thanks Silicon Flatirons for that as usual. Um, I, I think we have a pretty decent consensus among the group that there is a path forward. It's just going to be real hard. And until we have, as Scott put it, a decision to be optimistic by all of the parties that would be involved, we're a little bit at a standstill. And once we get there, I think we've got the technology. And, and, and if, if we get people to have the drive to do it, we really could move forward, at least along the lines Ari is talking about, with finding some bands to try this out and see if it's worth doing on a, on a larger scale or if it's a spot market kind of thing where, where we can't find a broad set of, of spectrum bands or spectrum opportunities where this makes sense. But we'll never know unless people take Scott's approach and say, okay, I'm willing to set aside my pessimism and my preconceived notions of what I'm gonna get out of this band. And I'm gonna go forward and say, how can we, how can we move to the future on this one? Great, thank you. Uh, thank you all. I think we've got to wrap it up and move to the questions now. Again, citing the Phil Weiser rule. Uh, we've actually got two students lined up this time with, with questions. So I guess you've generated a lot of interesting thoughts here. Uh, first student is Caden Daly. Uh, so thank you everybody for um, all the information. This has been really interesting. Um, I don't have much of a tech background, but I want to definitely get involved. Um, got a little bit of an economics background, so hopefully that can be a little bit useful. Um, but my question um, is kind of centered around what the role of like transactional law and contracts would play in um, inspector sharing. Um, so I guess, is there a significant role for it? Um, I, let's see, I've got it right here. Um, or are like the constraints and limitations that have been placed on it, um, do they make the opportunity costs for getting actual transactional law involved um, too high, um, if that makes sense at all? I think it's a great question. Um, and I do think there's a role for contract law. Again, um, you know, this happens all the time within the communications industry. The standards get set by the government, but that doesn't mean that the parties, private parties can't themselves negotiate around the standards. And if everyone agrees, if if the in, in the in the in the sort of the, the bilateral negotiation, uh, you know. In, in, the, in, 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 in um, the example of spectrum sharing, if the party that has the spectrum agrees that, um, that it's okay uh, for a party that wants to share the spectrum to share the spectrum, it doesn't really matter what the rules are. I mean, they can work around the rules, but setting the rules are, it's very important to set the rules. Um, um, those are just those are standards that the government sets. But if the parties um, uh, agree that um, they can deviate from those standards uh, without with, without any one party raising any issues with the with the government, then um, they can do that. And 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 those 
situations, contract law is very important. Negotiating those contracts, those agreements are very, those voluntary agreements um, becomes very important. I think one thing you brought up that I think is worth, worth noting is, is the one line you used in there was bilateral. I think this only makes sense when you're talking about a bilateral relationship. And if you want to see where this plays out, you know, obviously if we're looking at a um, opportunistic environment, you can't know who the parties are, right? All the parties is anybody who has the right equipment and is willing to play by the rules. So there is no way to really negotiate a contractual change to that. Um, but if you want to see how it plays out with fewer parties than that, look what's currently happening between the United States government, T-Mobile, and DISH with respect to shutting off their CDMA network. I mean, at bottom, that is a question of contract and, and antitrust law, and it's playing out very publicly in a way that is making it difficult to move the ball forward if you're T-Mobile, because they want to shut down an older technology, and they're having a challenge doing so because of existing contractual arrangements. So um, I, I would say... I would urge some caution. I'm not sure it's the magic bullet we would all like it to be when it comes to trying to find ways to make spectrum sharing easier. Um, but are absolutely right. Obviously, in the CMRS world where you have all these bilateral relationships, it makes great sense. I love the question. And I love that my fellow panelist, who's an attorney, answered it first since it's a contract law. I love that. Um, you know, I guess I would just also point back to, I know I commented earlier about roaming as an example of where there is existing proof for sharing local system resources. And that certainly um, fits right into Ari's answer where, um, where you know, two, two or more commercial operators found a way through their own agreement and through contractual agreement to find a way to share spectrum. And then certainly the first net AT&T example is another example of the same thing. So I think we have really nice precedent for um, hopefully continuing um, to do just what um, what you're suggesting with your good question. Great, thank you very much. And our next student question is from uh, Taylor Hartley. Taylor, if you'd come up here. All right. Uh, hello again, Taylor Hurley. I'm a master business student, graduate in May. Um, so this has been a really fun two days. I learned a lot. Um, I think my biggest takeaway was just how important it is to use the spectrum efficiently. And um, while well, I thought DSS or dynamic spectrum sharing, I think that's super cool. And I know this has been mostly conversations between science and policy, and I know that things like government incentives and policies really going to help drive, um, you know, using the spectrum efficiently. So where do I come into play? As a young businesswoman who's interested in this space, who's passionate about it, what can I do to promote, you know, internally within businesses to pr promote this, to use it efficiently? And how do I help everyone build trust within this area what can i do i you know i think a lot of the trust is built on personal relationships and networks so you know what what you can do as you you know understand your organization's goals um, is is understand how they how they interact with other organizations or whether the how do they how they cross where are the conflicts and how can you have you know really frank and open conversations to the extent you know you can you can share information um, and build relationships and you know your your colleagues you will move through different organizations right as David pointed out you know he's he sat on you know opposite sides of the of a three sided table there so um, you know I think that as you go through your career it's it's that network and those relationships that will will enable you to be effective uh, going forward. Yeah, I can't improve on what Scott said. Um, it is very much an interpersonal game. Um, the spectrum world, while it may be growing uh, as more and more people get interested in it, it's a fairly small community uh, as, as technological communities go. And, and I think absolutely when it comes to um, what you can do to help, it's, 
it's show up with an open mind, right? Based on what we were talking about before and build relationships um, with, the right, with the right incentives in mind. Good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, so we've got a couple of questions uh, online. Um, <laughs> we've got some themes here that have gone across the uh, across the the panels. Uh, so I'll read one from Peter Burrell. When it comes to not policing transmitter receiver quality, is there a carrots and stick approach the FCC implement? This could be along the lines of if a threshold that they could have no guard band on the radio, but if it doesn't, they need to eat into their lease for a guard band. Anyone want to attack that? So, so I'll jump in, right? Um, there's no one size fits all approach. And I'll, I'll channel my inner Dale Hatfield for this one. You know, no one has worked harder on adjacent band interference and receivers than Dale Hatfield in his career. You know, the, the reality is there's gonna be different approaches depending on who the two adjacencies are, right? Two adjacent CMRS providers, as, as already already pointed out, have every incentive to strike a contractual agreement to make sure that they're in a good spot and that they're maximizing the use of the band. They've paid a lot of money for it. Um, on the other hand, putting a CMRS provider next to a scientific band produces the kind of situation where you'd have a very hard time coming up with a carrot and stick approach that, that could work um, similar to, to the, the CMRS model, right? You've got high power versus low power. You've got money generating versus non-money generating uh, ostensibly. And so I think if you're gonna look at this from an FCC perspective, it's gonna have to be, you have to take sort of each new allocation at face value and say, how are we going to do this? Because there is no such thing as a standard interface between two adjacent spectrum bands. So I, I agree, carrots and sticks are great and mixtures of the two, but it's gonna be individual tackling of each new situation. I think David said it well. I mean, I, I, I know, uh... <laughs> About of situations where the FCC has actually um, expressed the expectation that the incumbent was going to have to take certain steps to protect itself um, from uh, emissions from a new entrant, um, you know, um, making its um, its operations more robust with filtering or you know taking other measures. And um, I think we're going to likely we will likely see more. Um, actions like that, you know, um, from the FCC and other regulators as the demand for spectrum increases. Um, you know, and, but it, it, it really, the, the burdens that are imposed on the incumbent vary from band to band, David said, based on whatever the conditions that exist in that particular frequency band. And I don't, I don't see that changing. Um, um, much in the near future. That being said, I like where your head is. At. Um, I think there are going to be times when you have to look to internalize guard bands. I think there are going to be times where you have to look to say, we're going to put some performance requirements out there for your receivers. I think there are times when you're going to have to be more granular with emissions limits. Uh, all of those are potential options. And, and frankly, when you're looking at auction spectrum, looking at whether or not you build that into the auction revenue base, that some areas will be standard part 27 rules. For the non-FCC geeks, that's the, the standard power levels that we see for almost all of the frequencies that are used in your cell phones. Uh, or if there will be more of a variable to it based on a more dynamic spectrum environment than we have typically auctioned off. Um, I think those are all viable options, but absolutely a unique use case to put them on. It's hard to know which one is the right answer. Okay, anyone else wanna weigh in or? Okay, we've got another question that again, uh, an anonymous attendee, which is, uh, 
Any thoughts on the need for pre precise positioning in the context of using detailed propagation models? I know when to let engineers answer the question. <laughs> I was going to say, Keith, I was going to defer to you. You're the, you have more expertise than, than I do on propagation. Yeah, my, my thoughts are that precise positioning, precise positioning is, is very important. Uh, you know, knowing your, your propagation model for very, very, uh, very precise uh, propagation is going to depend very much on your position. If you're in an urban setting and your position accuracy doesn't tell you whether you're behind a, a tree or behind a building versus in the middle of the street on a direct line with the, the transmitter, you're going to get a completely different set of answers. So the positioning is, is very important. Uh, and it will become more important as we get into higher frequencies, which have uh, smaller propagation distances. And hence, you're going to have to have much more accurate uh, positioning and uh, propagation analysis. Anyone else want to jump in on that? <laughs> well, I certainly agree. And especially, I agree with your point, and especially as cell sizes become smaller and smaller and smaller. I don't know that I have that much else to answer on it, but I, I, I definitely certainly agree with that point. I would add that while propagation models are great for a priori decision making, once you've got things in the field. And as we're seeing play out now, as the FCC looks at its most uh, recent iteration of mapping, there is also a role for ignoring propagation models and doing real world testing and finding out what the ground truth is. Um, so I think it's worth, worth throwing that out there that while we agonize a lot over uh, uh, ex ante propagation modeling, we should as concerned with ex post testing. I I couldn't agree more with you on that, David. Measurement campaign is critical uh, moving forward as well. Um, let's see, I think, I think we've answered all the questions that we've got at this point. So um, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, this has been a great, great conference. Thank you to the moderators and David Rettel. Uh, very interesting conversation. I enjoyed it. I even got to answer a few questions, a question myself. So <laughs> thank you. And so with that, um, the formal part of our, our conference is over. Um, I'd like to go into a few announcements before we close. So uh, 